Again, this is our sixth class in this series. I want to touch back. I told you this is going to be my mantra is while I'm teaching. Hopefully you came here with readiness of mind, prepared yourself before you came to, to worship this morning, and you will continue to be prayer, and you will continue to search the scriptures to make sure everything that I say or anybody says, if you're listening um, online or um is what the Bible actually says. I, ha I heard a, a gentleman, I wanted to, I will just mention this now while it's on my mind, um, say the other day, it was a, a Church of Christ preacher, many of you may know, Wesley Simons, he um, was the director of the Tennessee, of the School of Preaching in Elizabethan, Tennessee, but anyway, it was an older sermon that I was listening to by him, and he mentioned, he says, how many of us love God? And he sure, I know, he said, I know all of our hands would go up. He says, how many of us really give to God the way we need to be given to him? And he says, I want you to think about that. He says, you know, there's 168 hours in the week. How many of us gave 16.8 hours to God this week? How many of us can say we gave him 10% of our time? I want you to think about that. It really hit me because I'm thinking, you know, when I prepare for a lesson, I usually spend six, eight, sometimes ten hours in preparation to teach this 45-minute class. <laughs> That's still not 10%. Still not 16.8 hours. Just something to think about. And in our own personal Bible study, own personal devotion. Um, anyway, it's just something that hit me. And I, something I want y'all to think about. How much time do we spend in the Word of God, allowing God to talk to us? So, getting on with our class. This is actually a timeline that came from my Logos Bible software. I thought it was interesting. It doesn't match my red theme that I picked out for this class, but uh, being blue. But it <clears throat> points out, and we've talked about some of this, but Paul, on his first missionary journey, A.D. 46 to 47, he establishes the church in Corinth, as we mentioned, around the 51 A.D. mark. And then around 54 to 55 A.D., so this is three, four, some people even speculate five years after he established the church at Corinth that he writes 1 Corinthians from Ephesus. Then about a year later, he writes 2 Corinthians from Macedonia. And then he's arrested in Jerusalem in 57, and he travels to Rome in 60 A.D., but I want you to think about that. This is four to five years, or say three to five years, after he established the church that he's having to contend with all of these issues and problems that we've mentioned in our other lesson. He spent 18 months with these Christians. I want us to keep in mind, these Christians had the miraculous gift of the Holy Spirit. I want us to keep that in mind. They could speak in tongues. They could prophesy. They had knowledge they hadn't studied and they still had these problems. I told us last week, we went through six and seven on verses, but I want to go back, and I was going to start at eight, but when I was, I had some verses that came to mind when I was reading and studying this that I didn't use or didn't talk about, and I want to talk about that, and I want to reemphasize this we here, however we speak wisdom among those who are mature. Yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. And I want to emphasize this, verses 6, 7, 12, 13, and 10, that we and us is refers to the apostles, because there's lots of false doctrines when you think that applies to us today. This we is not us. This we is the apostles, and we need to keep this in context. The apostles preach the true wisdom of God, not worldly wisdom of this age. Again, not the wisdom of the Greek philosophers. <clears throat> but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our glory. God ordained this before time began. This was not an afterthought. You know, the people that say, well, you know, when Jesus came, he could not establish his kingdom, so he had to go to plan B. Our God doesn't need a plan B. Think about that. Who, would, in the, who could even comprehend the God, the creator of everything, need a plan B? No. He only had the one plan, and that's all he needed, and he did this for our glory. And we read those passages last week in Romans. But this is a verse that came to mind. 
The secret things belong to the Lord our God, and those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. This verse is actually interesting. Linda and I were in a going to a restaurant. We were standing in line, and this gentleman in front of us was talking to another gentleman, and he mentioned this verse. I'd never heard this verse before. He said, the secret things belong to our Lord. So I pulled my phone out, pulled my Bible app up, and I'm looking at it, and I'm thinking, I need to remember that verse, especially the part that says, those things which are revealed belong to us. The things that are revealed, the Word of God, he gave to us, and notice that last section, we may do all the words of this law. That's the part people forget sometimes. We have to be doers of the word according to James. God expects us to be obedient to do these things. Verse <clears throat> Colossians 1, 26 through 28 says basically the same thing. The mystery which has been hidden from the ages, from the generations, but now has been revealed to his saints, to them God will to make known <clears throat> what are the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Him we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Again, notice that Paul preaches, we preach, Paul taught, we teach in all wisdom. We have the wisdom of the word. Paul had the miraculous wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. This Notice that in Christ Jesus and Christ is in us. I had a, a gentleman explain something to me one time. He was a science guy, and I thought this very interesting. He said, we are software. Have you ever thought of yourself as software? I did not until he mentioned this. He said, you, the real you, not this tent, as Paul says, that you can see from me, but the real me is software. He says, you are timeless, you're ageless, you're weightless, you're like software. So, you know, you download an app or update an app on your phone, it's transmitted through the air. You ever think about that? The software is transmitted through the air. The real us that we cannot see. And I never really thought about it. He says, you would, that's why you will live forever, because you're weightless, you're timeless. <clears throat> the part that's in you. He said, this box that we're in, like the computer box that you see that you can see, is the hardware part. And that's the outside. It's just one of the, being a, into science and being a computer nerd kind of re related to me. Maybe you can't relate to that. But, you know, Christ is in us. That's how he's in us and how we are in Christ, <clears throat> the real us. And Ephesians 3, 3 through 5 says the same thing. He said, Paul's talked to the Corinthians, the Colossians, now the Ephesians. How that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly already briefly written already, by which when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men. And again, nobody understood this before. It was not made known <clears throat> as it has now been revealed by the Holy Spirit to his apostles and prophets. Again, it's been revealed, and Jesus promised this in John 16. We'll look at it in a few more verses, I mean a few more <clears throat> slides, that this was promised to the apostles. Verse 8, now this is kind of where we're picking up where we left off last, time, last week. Which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Knew, they should have known. Think about it. There had been plenty of evidence given the hundreds of prophecies that Christ fulfilled. He spent three years in this ministry talking. It wasn't like it was done in secret. Even Pilate was reluctant to punish Jesus. And as clearly seen from the scriptures in Luke 23, 14 through 24. Verse 9. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. That word heart, I underlined it because it's cardia, is the Greek word there, and that means mind, inner life, or heart. A inner life is actually the best translation from there, into the inner life of man. 
and the eye has not seen nor the ear heard. You know, before Jesus came, no man by human wisdom could understand the blessings of salvation in Christ Jesus our Lord. Think about what they have. They had the Greek gods, pagans. They had the Roman gods, paganism. Then they had the Jewish religion. They had the one true God, but even they could not comprehend God sending his only son to be a sacrifice for mankind. Verse 10, but God has revealed them to us, again the apostles, through his spirit. <clears throat> Excuse me. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God to us. Again, refers to the apostles through his Spirit. Yes, sir. You don't want that Ephesians. I was thinking I just looked at further down. Go along with what you're saying. <clears throat> Verse 9 and 10, it says, And to bring light to the menstruations, the mystery which has been hidden in ages in God, who created all things. And then Verse 10 always amazed me. So that the manifold wisdom of God might be made known through the church to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. Even those, whether you put Dick, Satan, the demons, the angels, not, even, not only mankind, but even the principalities in the heavenly places did not understand or know. Right. <clears throat> Through the apostles, and now in verse 10, you know, with the Bible, of course, mm -hmm. made known through the church. Doesn't that make us feel really special? It should make us feel special, yes, because it was made known through the church. You know, it's interesting, I think it's First Peter says, even the angels peered down from heaven to look at Christ dying. They couldn't understand because they didn't know. Um, so, yes, it's very, very interesting. So this is through the Spirit. The Word of God here refers to the spot, Father working through the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. The deep things, that's the unfathomable things. Only God can explain God. I want us to really think about that. Again, only God can explain God. There's, that's the only way it can happen. It's, man cannot explain it. I was actually going to go into the whole thing on the Holy Spirit right here. I deleted those slides because that could be a whole class by itself. Actually, I've taught several classes on that. But, um, but I do want to talk about the Godhead itself. There's so much misunderstanding and even I have a hard time comprehending this, to be honest with you. God the Father, God the Spirit, God the Son are one. We see that from Romans 3.30, Ephesians 4, 4 through 6, 1 Timothy 17, um, and, sec and chapter 2, 5, and 1 John 5.20. We see that, we read it, but to understand it is still a difficult thing in our, my, my mind. Anyway, I say that. But there, <clears throat> hopefully this will help us all. There is only one essence of God, the deity. But there are three distinct persons in the Godhead. The Godhead means the three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in one distinct God. But we must not view the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit as attributes of God. For each of these three persons in the Godhead are called God. I know my son and grandson, when I was there visiting in January, I cannot remember the terminology because I was trying to explain it to my grandson and I did not do a good job and of this um, essence. And I think some of this is because of, again, we can't comprehend everything. And part of the reason is we live in, most people say four dimensions, I say three and a half dimensions because time only moves forward, time can't move back for us. So that's a half a dimension. <clears throat> But God lives in the full 10 or 11 dimensions that we, or scientists, say exist. And if you could see God in these other dimensions, we could probably comprehend, but we can't see into those other dimensions where God lives and exists. But we do understand from the baptism of Christ Jesus, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. Behold, the heavens were open to him, and he saw the Spirit of God <clears throat> descending like a dove and alighting upon him. And suddenly a voice came from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Here we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all together in this one event. 
all three distinct persons of the one God are in this one event here. So we can understand from this, you have the Father speaking from heaven, you have the Son standing in the water, the Spirit descending like a dove. <clears throat> so we can, that hopefully will help get a better clarity in our mind. Three distinct, but one deity, one God. Verse 11, for what man knows the things of for what man knows the things of a man except the spirit which of the man which is in him? <clears throat> Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God. Again, full deity is given to the spirit of God. Notice the spirit of the man which is in him. We have an essence in us. The real, that which is like I said, that's the real us that we cannot see. And we can see that from 2 Corinthians 4, 16. He says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man, this physical body is perishing, the inward man is being renewed day by day. And hopefully we're being renewed, as Romans 12, 2 says, because we're not being conformed to the world, but we're being transformed by renewing our mind by studying the word of God that we may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might know the things which have been freely given to us by God. Again, this we and us here are the apostles, not us today. And we know that means in order that we may know to us by God, through the Son, by the Holy Spirit. And we looked at that Ephesians 3 passage, but let's look at that John 16 passage. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority. Whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, and he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Again, this is Jesus speaking to his apostles as the promise, and that's what Paul's referring to. The spirit came to them in that miraculous event, we, we don't see it happening ex actually with Paul precisely the same as it happened with the other apostles with the fiery tongues and the wind and noise and all that stuff. And I believe that's the way it happened with Cornelius. It doesn't say that. That's just my personal judgment in Acts 10. But we don't see that with, that with Paul. But we know he had that miraculous gift because he could pass it on to others. Verse 13, these things we also speak, again the apostles, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Again, they did not use the words of the scribes or the philosophers or what way men normally talk, but they were comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Hopefully you can read that. I had to make it the type a little smaller to get it on the screen. But this comes from the interpretation of the first Corinthians by R.C.H. Linsky. It says, as a result of using words taught them by the Spirit himself, he and his fellow apostles combined only spiritual words with the spiritual things they preach. Again, the Holy Spirit taught them what to say as the, and they were teaching what the Holy Spirit taught them to say. We don't do we think about the Holy Spirit teaching? That's exactly what that verse says he does. But here. He will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak. That's how I see that. God the Father speaking to through the Spirit, God the Spirit. He's speaking, he's only speaking what he hears, so we have to be hearing it from who? God? I, I, I think that's so we can, I think he says that so again, we can comprehend in human terms something that is incomprehensible. That's pretty incomprehensible. God the. I, I agree. That's why I was saying it's very difficult. And Martin, I don't know if you've studied the Godhead and you can give any insight to help us mere mortals understand <laughs> better. The way it's written, 
God the Father and God the Spirit are separated, and we know that there are two of them in this passage. I think that's what he's teaching us. Right. They're, they're, in, they're distinct, but they're still one God. Yes, Judy. Oh, that's very interesting. So she said, she, somebody said it's like an egg. You have the shell, the white, and the yolk. It's all one. It's all egg, egg, but they can be separated. They can be distinctly different. But when you separate them, it's no longer an egg. Never heard that analogy, but that makes sense in my brain. I, yes? As a new Christian, yes. And he tells in John 12, he says, Every, you know, and he tells him, I was sent by the Father to do the will of the God. Father. Every word I speak is not from myself, Self, but from, it's the, from Father. the Father. So, I mean, they both have their different, um, the, the God, the Father, had their purposes for both of them. Very good point, yes. So, because Jesus did say, Everything I speak is not of my own, but it's of the Father. So, Again, same way here is the Spirit. And the purpose of that is he will glorify Jesus, glorify me, and take what is mine and declare it to you. So, the, again, he's teaching the disciples, I mean the apostles. <clears throat> Verse 14 and 15, I've got here together and we'll discuss them. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. I want to look at this a little bit in depth. Hopefully we've got enough time to get through what I want to do. But the natural man versus the spiritual man. Y'all look in your Bibles and what is that talking about? What do you think that's talking about? The natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. The reason I want to focus on this is because, again, the denominational view of this is very Calvinistic. They say the natural man to them is the unconverted man. The spiritual man is the child of God. Is this correct? No. This is not correct, and the reason it's not correct is the context is telling how the things of God are known to man by revelation. Verse 10, it makes a direct operation of the Holy Spirit necessary before a person can understand the will of God. That is not correct. It's also not correct because it makes God a respecter of persons in that he gives the Holy Spirit to some and withholds him from others arbitrarily. We know that is not the case because Paul, Peter in Acts 10, 34 to 35 says, Then Peter opened his mouth and said, In truth I perceive that God shows no partiality, but in every nation whoever fears him and works righteousness is accepted by him. God does not show partiality. He is not a respecter of persons. Now, could the natural man be an uninspired Christian and the spiritual man an inspired Christian? Remember, who is Corinthians written to? It is written to Christians. It is written to the church at Corinth. This is the correct view. Yes, it is correct. Because it is in harmony with the context. God reveals things to the apostles and prophets in verse 10. Because they spoke the things revealed to them by the Holy Spirit. Verse 13. The natural man or the uninspired Christian does not receive revelation and does not speak by inspiration. It is also correct because the inspired Christian man, he is spiritual because he is inspired by the Spirit, does receive and teach these things of God and is to be judged by no man. This means that his word is not to be disputed by any natural or uninspired man because he is inspired of God like the apostles. Cannot dispute their word is also correct because in this context both the natural man and the spiritual man are Christians. By extension, 
all non-Christians would also be in the category of the natural man because they do not receive direct revelation from the Holy Spirit. So, verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. For who has known the mind of the Lord? That comes from Isaiah 40, verse 13. This question demands a negative answer. No natural man can know the man of God. Only the Holy Spirit, God, who searches the deep things of God. Verse 3, 1. And I, brethren, notice he continues to call them brethren. These are Christians he is speaking to could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal, as to babes in Christ. Notice, Paul could not speak to them as those who were following the teachings of the Spirit because they were still guided by their fleshly desires and impulses. Paul was forced to treat them as spiritual babes. Remember, these Christians, Paul spent 18 months with them. They had the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this is four to five years, three to five years, say, after um, Paul was with them, and he is still calling them carnal. Hebrews five twelve through fourteen tells us, for though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God, and you have come to need milk and not solid food. Again, the writer of Hebrews is telling them the same things Paul's telling these Corinthians. They ought to be teachers, for everyone who partakes only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe, but solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who, by reason of use, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. The goal is for all of us to become teachers, to be in the word of God, to by use We have to be in the Word of God. That's how he speaks to us today. Verse 2. I fed you with milk and not with solid food until now you were not able to receive it and even now you're still not able. Because of their lack of study and appreciation of truth in their lives, they were still yielding to their carnal thoughts and practices. These brethren, again, are four to five years of being a Christian with the miraculous gifts of the Holy Spirit, yet they are still called babes. How sad is it? I'm sure Paul was very disappointed in what he had tried to teach them and lead them. For you are still carnal, for where there are envy, strife, and divisions among you, are you not carnal and behaving like men? Again, envy, strife, and vision. The carnal word is sarkios there, means fleshly. Having the nature of flesh, under the control of the animal appetites, governed by mere human nature and not by the Spirit of God, which the included idea of depravity. I want you to notice that under the control of animal appetites. We are people. We have the ability of self-control. We are not guided by instincts like the animals are guided. We have to control ourselves. Envy, strife, and divisions cannot be part of our lives. Where there is envy, you know, the sin of envy and jealousy is proof of their carnality. The Greek word literally means to boil. In this verse, the word means an envious, contentious rivalry. Paul calls the work of the flesh in Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, robberies, and the like. In other words, if I left out anything that I didn't put in here, anything like these things, of which I told you beforehand, just as I also tell you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. <clears throat> these This carnality we have to expunge from ourselves, or we will not inherit the kingdom of God. For when one says, I'm a Paul, and another, I'm a Paulus, are you not carnal? You know, are you not carnal? The wearing of the names of men is evidence of their yielding to their fleshly carnal desires. Even today, there's people that follow men instead of Christ, and we have to be careful with that. I started to take this part out. A true leader would never allow people to be used their name this way because it came to my mind, I believe it was Martin Luther that said, do not call yourself Lutherans after me. Call yourself Christians after Christ. He tried to stop them from doing that, yet they still did it anyway. 
Um, 1 1 Corinthians 3, verse 5. For who then is Paul, who is Apollos, but ministers through whom you believed, as the Lord gave gave to each one? You know, both Paul and Apollos were merely instruments of God that he used to bring these people to salvation through the obedience of the gospel message they preached, Romans 10, 13 through 14. Since the Lord gave them their talents and used each as it pleased him, men are not to be praised and followed as heads of factions. We've got to remember, always, all the glory belongs to God, not to the people. We are just servants. He goes on to say, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the increase. Notice here, I planted Paul. He says, I'm, you know, this is refers to the first work done in Corinth by Paul. And in Romans 15, 20, Paul says, For so I have made it my aim to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation. He's going out to the unchurched, people that have never heard Christ before is where Paul wants to go. And Corinth was obviously a, pl- a great place to do that. And he says, God gave the increase. The Greek word translation here indicates a continuous blessing from God to both the planter and the waterer. Notice, I planted Apollos watered. Apollos was we mentioned before about him. He was an eloquent man. He was not taught correctly. Then he was taught correctly by Priscilla and Aquila. And he went, I'm sure he, being an eloquent speaker for, you know, the Lord, he was able to continue to help and encourage that Corinthian church after Paul had left and wasn't there. And that's what we have to do. Always be either planting or watering is what we need to be doing. Hopefully when you're here and encouraging each other, you are being watered. Always the glory belongs to the God. So then, neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Again, neither he's saying neither an I or Apollos or anything. We are just servants of God. The conclusion is man is nothing without God. When I did this the other day practicing, this is where I got to in 45 minutes, so I'm going a little bit quicker trying to decide should I continue this I'm gonna go ahead and continue so I got five more minutes I want us to talk before we get into verses 8 through 15 about this section is about salvation preaching and evangelism but and teach, teaching yes teaching um, so You know, what we've got to remember is salvation is conditional. It's a conditional gift of God requiring man's obedience. Salvation is by God's grace, and we all understand that. Ephesians 2, 8, Romans 6, 3. I want to look at Ephesians 2, 8 in depth here a little bit. But to receive the benefits of God's grace, man is required to do works of obedience, not works of merit. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 says, For by the grace you have been saved through faith, which is not of yourselves, it's salvation. It, salvation, is the gift of God, not of works. And that's talking about works of merit. Lest anyone should boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. And that's for works of obedience, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. And I put this in parentheses for clarity, hopefully, but I want to ask you this question. You know, people always quote, especially the denominational world, Ephesians 2, 8, 9. They don't rarely ever do they add verse 10 in there, but created in Christ Jesus. How or when does created in Christ Jesus happen? That happens at baptism, exactly. And I can't remember... We were in that building over there, which preacher we came that pointed that out to me. He said, baptism is in that verse. You just got to read verse 10. That's when we're created. We're created in Christ Jesus when we are baptized. Colossians, I mean, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 tells us, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Again, that's when we are in the new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Romans 6, 3, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? 
Galatians 3.27, for as many of us as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Again, that's when we get into Christ, is once we the final act of obedience of baptism. Faith alone has never been enough for righteousness. You know, the demons have faith, and James 2.17 says the demons... You know, believe and tremble, but they are not righteous. I had I brought that up to a guy that was door knocking one time and talking to him, and he said, "Yeah, but they didn't confess Christ." But if you really look at the the back in Jesus, they did confess Christ, and Jesus told them to be quiet, not because it wasn't his time. So anyway, righteousness requires faith and obedience working together. You can't have one without another. Why is there confusion in the religious world today concerning the issue of faith and works? Any uh, any comments on that? Yes, sir. I think you can look at a lot of where Paul talking about works, going back to Romans and Galatians. It's, a lot of times it's works of the law. Works of the law. I'll say with disputing with the um, Pharisees about the law and being to be saved by their works of the law. Mm -hmm. But then I think of Titus, every chapter of Titus, if you want good works other than James, I mean, Titus 1, 2, and 3 both say we're supposed to be zealous for good works, mm -hmm. we're created for good works, and you can see a person who is. Um, a Christian or not a Christian by their good works or their bad works. But I mean, I always go to Titus with people when they talk about this works because he, he talks about being ready for works. Mm -hmm. you know, Timothy. That's a good um, point. Timothy. Titus is a very good example of being exactly. Zealous for good works. We're prepared for, for good, good works. works. What does that mean? Right. Zealous for good works, prepared for good works. You know, the world, for some reason, thinks it's got to be one extreme or the other. You know, it's either the faith-only crowd or it's the works-only crowd. Um, and that leads to a lot of this confusion. Um, but the Bible is clear that neither of those extremes are correct. God's Word teaches that we are counted as righteousness when we combine faith and works of obedience. I'm going to get through this one little section here. It says Galatians 5, 6 tells us, For in Christ neither circumcision or uncircumcision avails anything but faith working through love. James 2, 18 and 22, But someone will say, You have faith, I have works. Show me your faith without your works. I will show you my faith by my works. And that's what he's saying. Do you not see that faith was working together with his works, and by works faith was made perfect? <clears throat> I'll have to add those Titus things in next time but um, thank you for that but yeah it's got to work together you know we are known by our fruit we are known by our fruit and what is our fruit hopefully it's because it's obedient in Christ so we'll get to uh, verse 8 and we'll pick up there next time thank you very much I appreciate your kind attention in